3D printing with spent coffee grounds, 3D prints with an internal resistor network for multi-point sensing and biofiber spinning were some incredible projects that I found at the Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Festival 2023 in Loveland, Colorado. The utility research lab of the Atlas Institute from the University of Colorado Boulder had a booth there and displayed some of their impressive projects to the public. Let's find out more. Guten Tag everybody, I'm Stefan and welcome to CNC Kitchen. This video is sponsored by Voxel PLA. Get one kilogram of their reliable Pro PLA for only $16.99 with free shipping in the US when ordering three spools or more. Visit them at voxelpla.com. The Rocky Mountain Rep Rep Festival that took place an hour north of Denver was an amazing experience for every 3D printing enthusiast. Yet what really excited me was the work of the Utility Research Lab, which is part of the University of Colorado, located in Boulder. They use and work with additive manufacturing in a lot of their scientific projects and exhibited some stuff that was right up my alley. Some of their work is already published and I will leave links to the papers and more information in the description. The first project that caught my attention, not only because I saw that some of my test hooks were manufactured in an interesting material, was 3D printing from spent coffee grounds presented by Michael Rivera. He told me that this project started due to the frustration of printing PLA, which is basically marked by every manufacturer as biodegradable. But in reality, it's not. PLA will only compost under very specific conditions and barely any commercial composting plant will accept your printed parts. So Michael and his team searched for a commonly available bio-based material to print with and ended up at spent coffee grounds, where every year 6 million tons are disposed of. I already tried to print with coffee myself and used spent coffee grounds as a filler material in PLA, replacing some of the plastic with waste. Yet they are approaching this from a different direction. They mix the dried coffee grounds with cellulose gum and xanthan gum, which are both very common food additives, and then add water until the mixture gets a peanut butter-like consistency. This base material is then extruded using the open source large volume extruder. Most of the parts that they showed were printed at 1mm layer height using a 1.6mm Lurlock nozzle. The prints are then dried for 24 hours until they fully solidify. These parts are now fully biodegradable and can either be tossed into a compost or crumbled up and used as a fertilizer for plants. And even better, this material is also fully recyclable because you can grind up your parts, add water and print the material again. And if we take a look at the environmental footprint of thermoplastic, plastic 3D printing, not requiring a heated nozzle or a heated bed makes this printing process even more sustainable. It was great to see how they coated some parts in wax to make them watertight and add functionality. Of course the prints do look a bit crude and don't show the amount of detail we are used in polymer printing. Still they created a baseline to improve on with different material compositions, extruder designs and workflows. This reminds me a lot of my first tries printing clay. But when I look at the work of for example Tom Loroman, a clay printing artist and teacher, I notice how much more can be achieved if you really dial in a process. Michael and his team have a vision of replacing thermoplastics with bio-based and biodegradable materials and even if we won't be printing with our leftovers from our morning coffee in the future, their work helps us explore new and innovative ideas that might be feasible for certain niche applications. Next to Michael's work on 3D printing coffee grounds were some really interesting looking structures where Sandra talked about her work on integrating circuitry into 3D prints to make them touch sensitive. The first thing that I saw were these strain gauge looking structures on the desk where I assumed she printed four sensors with a 3D printer. I was right that these were 3D printed conductive traces but Sandra did something a little different here. She started with the task of trying to make a structure capacitive touch sensitive and struggled to integrate all of the circuitry into a complex 3D print. The way they sense which point is getting touched is by using RC delay and their structure is a system of resistors and capacitors. 
At some point, they had the idea to 3D print the different valued resistors into a part using conductive filament instead of using regular resistors. Many of you may know that there is conductive filament available for your 3D prints and they are using the one from Protopasta. Unfortunately, many are often disappointed that this material has such a high resistance that it can barely be used as a conductor to power electronics. Yet exactly that property makes it great for printing resistors with it. By varying the length of the printed traces, Sandra can adjust and tune the resistance values in her structures. And this brings us back to the simple part I mistook for a strain gauge in the beginning. These were two-dimensional test patterns of different resistors from which she slowly transitioned to three-dimensional parts where for example these brighter rods in the middle have embedded traces with a specific resistance. Really ingenious. She currently prints the parts on a Prusa Mark III with a mosaic palette attached which splices the conductive and non-conductive filament together. Unfortunately, since she needs a really pure conductive filament, they always need to purge a tremendous amount of material, making this process quite wasteful. I think that this is a great example where multi-tool or IDEX printers could shine because they don't need any of this purging because every nozzle only uses one material type that doesn't get mixed. And this also shows how important it is that 3D printing process experts work closely together with engineers and scientists who use 3D printing as a tool because this helps to find the right technology for the task at hand. Sandra already dialed her process in very well and works on algorithms that make the design of these networks of resistors way easier. This was one of the projects I would really like to see more on events like this because it pushes the boundaries of the technology a little more and shows what's possible and how you can add functionality to otherwise static and passive parts. Another really interesting project was showcased at the Utility Research Lab table which also works with another waste product. What you can see here is biofiber spinning on an open source dry jet wet spinning machine which makes fibers from gelatin. The idea here again is to use waste stream materials to make new products. Colorado has a big meat industry that also produces a lot of gelatin as a side product and instead of throwing it away, LD uses it to make fibers for fabrics. The dry jet wet spinning machine is pretty simple and is based on a frame and the electronics of an old 3D printer. It uses a heated syringe extruder which creates a fiber that then is wound onto a big roller at the bottom. These rollers can also be placed in a bath to treat the fibers with different modifiers like glycerin to tailor its properties. The base product is simple gelatin as you can also just buy it in any store. Yet in order to give it its final properties so that it can be made into a fiber it needs to go through a special polymerization process involving water and isopropyl alcohol. The solution which has the consistency of honey is then filled into a syringe and kept with a heating mat at around 60 degrees celsius so it doesn't solidify. The nozzle is also heated but only to slightly above ambient and crucial to get the consistency right and achieve a certain diameter of the fiber. After leaving the nozzle the solution further cools down and quickly develops a solid hull on the outside. But why do we need biogelatin fibers in the first place? The idea of their work is to use the material for example in smart textiles. Separating electronics from conventional fabrics for recycling is often impossible. With these bio-based materials you just toss everything into hot water and simply dissolve the fabric away from the electronics. The open source fiber spinning machine is also a great and unique platform to give designers the possibility to create their own materials because there are currently no small scale machines for tasks like this on the market. And since basic material development also requires skilled chemists to design polymers with certain properties, this might also be a great and accessible machine for general material development because you can't only make fibers from meat-based gelatin but also from vegan agar agar for example. In the end it always excites me to see applications of 3D printing at events like this and not only the latest and greatest developments in printer technology itself. But what do you think about the projects that Michael, Sandra and LD showcased at their booth? Leave a comment down below and if you're happy with your current printer but need to stock up on high quality yet affordable filament then check out today's video sponsor Voxel PLA. Voxel PLA Pro sells for only $16.99 per 1 kg spool. They ship free within the US if you order 3 spools or more and if you need larger quantities they offer even bulk discounts. Voxel PLA developed their pro material for their own print farm where they run 150 production machines so you can be sure that you'll get a reliable material for your 
own projects or your business. So if you live in the US and want to restock your filament, then visit them at voxelpla.com. Thanks to Voxel PLA for sponsoring this video.